Good morning. Good morning. It, it's a pleasure to be here with you this morning. Um, I'd like to start by first thanking the church for giving me this, giving me this opportunity to speak, and especially David Uncle for asking me. So I hope I do it justice, and hopefully we can leave this place either challenged or encouraged by the Word of God this morning. I've been asked to speak, as you can see on the slide, on the person of Jesus Christ according to the Gospel of John. Now the Gospel of John is a very interesting Gospel. It's a very interesting book in the Bible. And, I, and as I was preparing for the sermon during the week, I came across quite a unique quote from a scholar of the Bible. His name is Bob Deffenboff. And I'd like you to hear what he says about the Gospel of John. He says this, For Christians, the Gospel of John is a source of much truth about our Lord. But it's much more than this. It's an opportunity for us to follow him as we read, to identify with his disciples. It's an opportunity for us to get to know the heart of our Savior and to fellowship with him through his word. If men of old found their hearts set on fire as they listened to him preach in person, then we will find our hearts warmed as we listen to him through his gospel. And I found that as, as I read through the gospel this week, I certainly felt like I was following Jesus, as if he was right there, as if the events were happening right in front of my face. It was an interesting experience. But because there's so much to know about the Gospel of John, I'd like to look at two specific events that made a real impact on me personally. And I think, well I hope, that they make an impact on you too this morning. And these events display two particular traits of Jesus that help us as hearers of the word to get a picture of who our Lord really is. So without further, further ado, let's turn to our first event. And if you have your Bibles with you, could you turn with me to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. Here we see a side of Jesus that many of us are quite familiar with. In John chapter 8, starting from verse 1. You see, this story we're quite familiar with, even though it's not really mentioned in the other Gospels. It's very unique to John. Only John talks about this story. And here we see the acceptance of Jesus. Sorry, just one back. The acceptance of Jesus. And so if you'll read in John chapter 8 and verse 1, we read these words. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now the Mount of Olives was a hill place close to Jerusalem and this was where Jesus was at that time verse 2 now early in the morning he came again into the temple and all the people came to him and he sat down and taught them then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery and when they had set her in the midst they said to him teacher this woman was caught in the in, in adultery in the very act now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? They said this, this they said, testing him that they might have something of which to accuse him. You know, it seems to me that in the Gospel of John and in any other Gospel, whenever there's mention of the Pharisees, there's always trouble. It's almost like the Bible is portraying the Pharisees as some kind of villains. But let, let's just stop and try to get some background and knowledge about the Pharisees in the first place. See, the Pharisees, along with a couple of other groups known as the scribes and the Sadducees, were the religious leaders of Israel at the time. They were men who were learnt in the Torah and Judaism. They were usually well-educated people, they were wealthy, and they usually had influence in politics. They held a pretty high status in society and they were held in high regard by the people. But not only that, they were the elite group. They enjoyed secure lifestyles, and they enjoyed many pleasures of the world. They were on fairly good terms with the Roman Empire as well. And this is probably why many of them had a problem with Jesus. Because Jesus' style of teaching was very radical. It was very extreme. It called people to carry their cross, to forsake the pleasures of the world and his teaching sort of threatened their secure lifestyles and so many of them wanted to get rid of Jesus 
They wanted to silence him, to kill him. For these people were greedy and evil men who cared nothing for the things of God, even though they went under the pretense of God. They were, as the saying goes, wolves in sheep's clothing. In fact, the Bible seems to show them as villains of the Gospels. Not all of them, of course. So, some of them were good people, like Nicodemus or Joseph of Arimathea. But the Bible always seems to show them as people who are always out to spoil the day, always out to hurt or trick Jesus in some way. And this story here in John chapter 8 is a great example of this. Notice what they did. They bring to Jesus a woman caught in the act of adultery. You can just imagine this woman, can't you? Screaming and kicking, crying in fear and shame. But they don't care. They drag her to Jesus. And then they ask Jesus a very cunning question. They say this, according to the law of Moses, this woman should be stoned. But what do you think we should do? Notice how their question didn't really have a right answer. If Jesus said, all right, stone her, they would have accused him of only judging the woman and not the man in the act of adultery. If Jesus said, don't stone her, they would have accused him of not obeying God's law. So either way, Jesus couldn't really win in this, in this situation. Have you ever been in a situation like that? Where a person comes to you and asks you a question and really there's nothing you can say that's the right answer. That person's just out to find something wrong with you. And John explains quite clearly here that the Pharisees asked him this to test him. That they might have something to accuse him with. But Jesus has a very wise response. Notice what he does in verse 6, 6 to 11. He says this, But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger, as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. And when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Do you see the beauty of Jesus' response here? Can you see what Jesus has done here? <coughs> You see, what Jesus has done here is he hasn't condemned the woman, but he doesn't ignore the woman's sin either. Instead, he does something very unique, something that the prophets and teachers of old were, weren't able to do. He forgives her. Now, let's think about this for, for, for a moment. It was the law of Moses which stated that this adulterous woman had to be put to death. It was God's law, and it was the law that dragged this woman to Jesus. Yes, it was the Pharisees who brought her to Jesus, but really it was the law. She was brought to the holy presence of a God who is expected to punish her for her sin. But instead of dishing out the punishment, the God to whom this woman sinned offers her grace and forgiveness. But notice how there's more to the story. Jesus offers her forgiveness. He doesn't condemn her. But although his forgiveness is free, his forgiveness is not cheap. This woman sinned, and Jesus knew that. And Jesus says, you're, you're forgiven. But what gives Jesus the right to forgive her in the first place? Because if a sin's been committed, it's like a crime against God. And in any court of law, when a crime's been committed, it has to be punished, right? Someone has to pay. But what gave Jesus the right to forgive her? And I think the answer is because Jesus himself would pay for her sins. Jesus himself would pay for her sins. He'd take the punishment as if he himself was the adulterer. I like to believe that when Jesus said to this woman, neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more, he was picturing in his mind the cross. I, I like to think that he was picturing 
how her sin would hang him to that cross, how her sin would be responsible for those whips on his back, how her sin would hang him and how her sin would drive those nails into his hands and his feet, how her sin would draw blood from his body and break his body. Nevertheless, he still offers her forgiveness. He could have just ignored the woman. He could have condemned the woman. But he chooses to forgive at his own expense. And today he offers anyone who will come to him forgiveness. Isn't that the beauty of it? This happened 2,000 years ago. But Jesus' response is still the same to anyone who comes to him. It doesn't matter what that person may have done in life. How filthy or vile his or her sin may be. I mean, this woman was an adulteress. And in Jewish culture, you can't get any lower than that. That's pretty much the worst thing you can do. That's the worst person you can be. The Bible says that adultery is disgusting to the Lord, but when she came to Jesus, he proved himself to be a person of acceptance. He will forgive your sins, for he paid for them himself on the cross. His forgiveness is free, but it's not cheap. You know, as I thought about this truth, I was reminded of that famous verse, which I'm sure all of us know. John 3.16 For God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to, con to condemn the world. You know, God's Son didn't come to condemn this woman, but He came that the world through Him might be saved. You know, we spent this morning remembering how it's Father's Day today. In fact, I got a polite email from, da from David Uncle during the week reminding me that today was Father's Day. I probably would have forgotten. But I, I remember now, and I realize today that many across the world are showing in various ways how much they, they appreciate their fathers for what they've done. We've just seen a daughter play a song for her father and for all the fathers, of course. And to me, I, I always wonder, how do we appreciate God the Father for what He's done? In fact, what has He done? We think of John 3.16, He sent His Son. You know, it's always gone through my head, what, what did God the Father think when Jesus was hanging on the cross? What went through His mind? What were His emotions like? What would He have felt as He saw His Son hanging on the cross for my sins and for your sins? for the world's sins, for this woman's sins. Is it even possible to understand or try to comprehend that? And you know, I think the answer is no, you can't fully un understand what the father must have gone through. But I remember hearing a story long ago that gave me a picture of the father's love and the father's pain. In fact, this story is really famous and it's much loved. And it's been made into a short movie as well. If you type it up on YouTube, you'll probably find it. It originated from a short story called To Sacrifice a Son. And it was written by a man named Dennis Hensley. I'd like you to listen to the stirring story. There was once a bridge which spanned a large river. During most of the day, the bridge sat with its length running parallel to the banks. This allowed ships to pass through freely on both sides of the bridge. But at certain times each day, a train would come along the bridge, and so the bridge had to be turned sideways, perpendicular to the river, so the train could pass, could cross it. Now there was a switchman or a controller who sat in a hut on one side of the river, and he operated the controls to turn the bridge into position so that the train could pass. One evening, as the switchman was waiting for the last train of the day to come, he looked off into the distance through the dimming twilight and caught sight of the train lights. He stepped into the control hut, waited un until the train was a certain distance away, and he turned the bridge, just as normal, just as every day. But what he saw next made his blood run cold in horror. For as he looked out onto the bridge, he saw his four-year-old son playing on the bridge. Now his first reaction was to cry out, run, run, boy. But he realized the train was far too close and his tiny legs would never make it across the bridge in time. 
the man was left with a devastating decision. Does he hit the controls again and turn the bridge back around to save his son from being hit by the train? If he did that, the train would jump the track and fall into the river, taking with it the many people who were on board. Or does he leave the bridge as it is and allow the train to pass safely? He had a pretty heartbreaking choice. Either the people on the train or his young son must die. He took a moment to make his decision. Then, bowing his head in defeat, he closed his eyes as great teardrops fell to the ground. He decided to leave the controls just as they were. The train sped safely and swiftly across the bridge. No one on board was even aware of that tiny boy and his broken body hit by the train and mercilessly thrown into the river. They weren't aware even of that pitiful figure of the sobbing man in the control hut. They didn't see him. They didn't care. And they didn't see him walking home very slowly that day as he went and told his wife how their son had been brutally killed. Now if you can comprehend the emotions which went through this man's heart, I think you can begin to understand the feelings of our Father in Heaven when he sacrificed his son to bridge the gap between us and eternal life. But the question is this, how does he feel when we speed along through life without giving a thought for what he has done, for what he has done through Jesus his son? You know, when, when, when I read that story, I became a little bit emotional, even though I've heard the story many times. I like to think I'm not an emotional guy, but this sort of touched me. It cuts right to the heart, doesn't it? I can see some tears in some people's eyes. And something like this is what God the Father must have gone through in order to send His Son to die for us, for our sins. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son. The Father is a person of love. Happy Father's Day. We appreciate our Father. And Jesus, His Son, is a person of acceptance. Let's thank God for that this morning. But let's just not thank Him with words and songs. Let, let's show Him our gratitude day in, day out. It shouldn't just end on a Sunday. Continue it through Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Think, talk, do the things that please Him, that show Him your gratitude. Show Him how thankful you really are. That's the first event. The woman, Jesus, and the adulterous woman. Now let's look at the second event. And just like the first event, this event is quite unique to the Gospel of John because it's not found anywhere else. And this story speaks about the authority of Jesus. Turn, turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 11. John chap chapter 11. In this chapter, we see an amazing event take place. Now before we read the text, I'd like to explain the situation here. Jesus right now is in the wilderness area of the Jordan, near the, near the river Jordan in Israel. And while there, he receives a message that, that a man whom he loved named Lazarus was very sick. He was about to die because of his sickness. Now Lazarus had two sisters, Mary and Martha. And this whole family Jesus dearly loved. In fact, it's believed that on Jesus' regular visits to Jerusalem, he would stop over at their house because they lived in a town called Bethany, which was only a two-mile walk from Jerusalem. And whenever Jesus was in Jerusalem, people tried to kill him most of the time. So Bethany was a perfect place, not too far from Jerusalem, but far enough so he, he could escape those who were trying to persecute him. And so he'd stay at their house many times and they'd enjoy sweet fellowship together. Mary, Martha and Lazarus had come to know Jesus so well and love Him so well and Jesus in turn loved them so well. And now here Jesus is in the wilderness of the Jordan with His disciples and He receives a message sent by these sisters. And these sisters are urging Him to come to the town of Bethany where they are because Lazarus is ill and they don't want Lazarus to die. They believe that if Jesus comes, He can heal Lazarus of the sickness. 
because Jesus himself had healed many sicknesses before. But Jesus does a very interesting and very unique thing here. Instead of listening to, to their pleas, to the pleas of a loved one, Jesus decides to stay where he is for another two more days. And then when Jesus finally arrives at the town of Bethany, he finds the whole town in mourning. It's a funeral, a funeral procession. Lazarus had died. Of course, Jesus knew all about this. He is, he is the Son of God. He knows about this. But what he does next shocks everyone who's there. It shocks the sisters. It shocks the Jews who are present. And it even shocks his own disciples who, who themselves had witnessed many great things from Jesus. Now Lazarus was laid in a tomb, carved out in the rock. And I'd like you to watch what Jesus does next in verse 32 of chapter 11. Let's read this together. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. It's an interesting verse. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Verse 35, Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Now verse 35, as you can see, is the shortest verse in the Bible. It's only two words. But to me, there's no verse in the Bible that describes the love of God for mankind in a better way. Jesus wept. You know, there have been many ideas and many theories raised by scholars and theologians as to why Jesus may have wept here. Some, some say it's because he was disturbed that the people didn't have faith. Others say he was just emotionally charged at that time. There's a lot of debate. But for me personally, the reason why Jesus wept is very, very simple. You see, it shows me that I serve a God who is deeply touched by human sorrow and grief. After all, this was a time of, of intense grief. This is death we're talking about. You know, death of a loved one always seems to bring about in a person's life the time of deepest sadness and deepest sorrow. I'm sure many of us have experienced the loss of a loved one and how it tore our lives for a period of time. We were in a pit of sadness during that period. And this is what is happening here for these people for Mary, for Martha, and for the friends of Lazarus who were there. They were grieving over the loss of their beloved Lazarus. And here Jesus stands, he looks around and he sees all this, and he's cut to the heart by all of this, and he begins to cry, he begins to weep. Now I believe that John here is portraying a side of God that is very different to how many people see God. You know, sometimes it's easy for us as believers and even easier for non-believers to see God as someone who doesn't really care, who can't really relate to our personal problems, not the general problems, our personal individual problems. We all have individual issues and concerns, things that are unique to us. And we think, God, you can't relate to those things. We think of Him as someone who knows about our pro problems, He knows everything about it, but He can't relate. And in fact, if you look at most of the world's religions out there, you'll see that, they, that there are gods and goddesses out there in those religions who don't really get involved with the human condition, do they? They, they? they don't really involve themselves in human emotion. They don't really involve themselves in human sorrow or human grief because they're above that, they're beyond that. They don't get in with the mess and muck of humanity. But here John gives us an image of God who suffers with us in our grief. He bears the sorrows that we bear and he shares in the heartaches that we share in life. This is a God who desperately cares for the people that he has made. And you know, I'm reminded of those verses in the Old Testament. Uh, we usually associate these verses to the death of Jesus where whenever we take the bread and the, and the cup but very rarely do we sort of associate them with the life of Jesus. I'd, I'd like to read these verses to you and you can make your own ju judgment about whether they fit. 
Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 3. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We always think of that as a cross, as Jesus on the cross. Verse 4, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Now I'd like you to think of Jesus as described there and think, does he fit with this description here? And to me it's a pretty clear connection. He is a man of sorrows. He acquainted with our grief. He has borne our griefs. He's carried our sorrows. And to me Jesus is not just someone who suffered in death, but he suffered in life. He went through the same pains and struggles that we go through because he wants to relate. He didn't need to, but he went through them because he's a person who cares. I'm so glad that I serve a God like Jesus. But you know, there's more to the story. And if we continue reading in verse 38, we read these words. Then Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there's a stench, for he has been dead for four days. <coughs> Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Verse 43, Now when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Loose him, loose them, and let him go. Now to me, that is the greatest miracle that Jesus ever performed on earth, apart from his own resurrection from the dead. Lazarus was a dead man. In fact, he wasn't just dead for a few hours, he, he'd been dead for four days. His body began to stink. But at the Master's voice, even the dead man walks. It seems to me that the Master's voice transcends, goes beyond the curtain of death so that even the dead man has to hear his voice and has to listen, has to obey. And that is what I believe is the authority of <coughs> Jesus. He has authority over perhaps the greatest barrier in human life, death. And if he can prove his authority there, he can prove his, his authority anywhere. You know, the Jesus we serve this morning has authority over death and hell. He has the authority and power to create life. That's what Genesis is all about. He has the authority to destroy life. He has the authority to bring life back from the dead. Let's not forget who we're serving this morning. Let, let's not forget who we just sang to this morning. He is the eternal fountain of life. And He has authority over all things. Thinking, thinking about it in a practical aspect, I believe that this raising of Lazarus from the dead is a picture of how we as believers will also be raised to life when Jesus returns. Whether we're still alive or whether we're in the grave, it doesn't really matter. Because a time is coming when you will hear the Lord's voice shout, Come forth. It may not be Lazarus come forth, it will be Jophia come forth. Or you put, just insert your name there. Blank, come forth. But the question is, are we ready? Are you ready to hear the Lord's voice? And when He calls your name, will He call your name to life or will He call your name to death? If you're a believer, you know for sure that He'll call your name to life, just like He did to Lazarus. Eternal life, in fact. But for the unbeliever, it's quite a different story. If you want to be among those, among the saints who are called to life, you need to put your trust in Jesus. You need to believe that He died for your sins, that He rose again, that He's the Son of God and that He's forgiven you. You need to accept Him and make Him the Lord of your life. The authority of Jesus was displayed that day at Bethany with Lazarus. And be assured it will be displayed again in a coming day. 
those were the two events that, 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 that I wanted to talk about this morning. You know, there's so much more in the Gospel of John to say about the person of Jesus Christ. And this morning we've only looked at his, his character of acceptance and his authority. But you know, just by hearing the message and not really doing anything about it, it's, pretty, it's probably just as bad as not hearing the message in the first place. In other words, when you hear something about the person of Jesus, God sort of expects you to do something about it. And I believe the Gospel of John makes it quite clear for both the believer and the unbeliever. After all, John wrote this book for both new Christians who were starting out in the faith and for those who were searching for truth. For the believer, it's clear we're to be encouraged, we're to be strengthened in the God we serve. Remember, we serve a good, good God. We work for Him. We ought to give Him our leadership, sorry, the leadership over our lives. We ought to let Him lead us and guide us till He calls us home one day. And for the believer, the message is even more simple. Jesus is the Son of God. He's all that He claimed to be. Put your trust in Him before it's too late. That's pretty much what John's saying. In fact, you can hear John's words himself in John chapter 20 and verse 30. John chapter 20 and verse 30. He says this, and truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. That's really the whole point of the Gospel of John. That you may know and that you may believe. Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, <clears throat> we give thanks this morning that we serve a God who is both accepting and loving and authoritative. We thank you that you have authority over all things and you have chosen us to be your friends. You have saved us from the pit and you've given us life eternal. Help us therefore as believers and non-believers to surrender first and foremost our hearts to you following that with our minds and our bodies, that we might honor the Jesus of the Gospel of John. We give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.